How's everybody doing on this rainy Salisbury evening? I'm Julia Glanz, I'm your city administrator, and I am here to give a little bit of an update on where we are this evening and timing. If you were on uh, social media today or if you were on C-SPAN today, I'm sure there's many C-SPAN watchers in the room, uh, you saw our great mayor testifying before the Senate um, on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So he was there speaking about why it's important, uh, thanking our senators first for the money that has been passed down uh, to many local jurisdictions across the country, uh, but to reiterate why it's important for local government, those closest to the citizens, to be entrusted with those dollars to make important transportation decisions uh, instead of allowing, no, dis no disrespect, uh, our state partners to uh, decide what to do with those, those, those dollars, uh, which may just go into highway widening projects and things like that, which uh, we know have their challenges. So uh, he got some, some hard questions from our senators, uh, but as you can imagine, that lined up with some DC uh, commuter traffic. So we are running a little bit behind. So there are some tasty treats in the back. Uh, we've got a wonderful band. And uh, you know, if anybody wants to come up and do some karaoke, we can arrange that. April, I'm feeling, I'm feeling like you're feeling it. Yep. So uh, we are going to get started at about 7.20, uh, and then he'll make a grand entrance a little after that. Uh, so just wanted to update folks. If anybody does have to leave early, totally understand um, that this is a, a big ask of all of you, but appreciate your patience and understanding as uh, both of these events tonight were incredibly important. So we want to do both and didn't want to cancel. So before I introduce our first guest, I do want to make a tiny little pitch for our uh, comprehensive ba plastic bag reduction uh, ordinance. Grace Murdoch will be passing out reusable bags at the end of the evening. So if you'd like a reusable bag uh, to support our green efforts, please see Grace on the way out. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> So I'd like to welcome up our dear friend who has uh, also traveled quite a distance to be here tonight, back from Hawaii uh, on a much deserved uh, break and, and time away from Salisbury, uh, our dear friend, Reverend John Wright. Thank you, Julia. It is such an honor to be with you all this evening. I would like to invite you to please join me in the spirit of prayer as I read this invocation. Mother, Father, God, Yahweh, Allah, Great Spirit, First Cause, you who are known by many names and yet fully known by none, we open ourselves to you and call upon you to be with us this evening. We are the inheritors of this land where lived our Chop Tank, White Comico, Lenny Lenape, Nanticoke, and other ancestors. We are the inheritors of this land worked by slaves and dis descendants of slaves, owners of slaves and their descendants, immigrants and descendants of immigrants. We are the inheritors of this land with its rich and complicated history, its glory and its shame. We are the inheritors of this land, its abundant wildlife and fertile soil, its marshes and its bays. May each of us in our own way be worthy stewards of this rich and complex inheritance. Holy One. We ask for blessings on the good and true servants whom we have entrusted with the governance of this beautiful city of ours, and on those who work diligently for our well-being, those employees and volunteers who labor daily to ensure our health, safety, and well-being. May they recognize the common humanity and human needs that bind us together and see our differences as uniqueness rather than division. May they continue to help our city to flourish, to help our citizens to thrive, 
and to help our environment to heal and prosper. May they find opportunities to expand their good works to help build a more just, inclusive, and welcoming Wicomico County and Delmarva Peninsula. And finally, source of all, I ask for blessings on this assemblage gathered here on this beautiful campus. May we welcome the words of our beloved mayor, gratefully acknowledge the successes of the past, and accept the challenges of the future with grace and confidence. May each of us find the strength, courage, and wisdom to do what must be done, for it is only in this that your will will truly be done. These things we ask in those names with which we call upon the holy. Amen, amen, and blessed be. Thank you, John, for your beautiful words. It's always such a pleasure to hear your prayers and take time to just slow down a minute and really think about what's uh, important to all of us. Our next speaker, uh, bringing greetings from Salisbury University, is Dr. Karen Olmsted. Uh, Karen has been with the university since 2008 uh, and recently has announced her retirement next December. Uh, and we are so, uh, we've been so lucky uh, to have you as a, as a dean of the Henson School and as our provost here, uh, taking us to, to new heights. And I certainly wish you all the best. I know everybody in this room does. So, Karen. Thanks so much, Julia. And uh, so, yeah, I've been here 15 years, but I've been an educator for well over 30 years. And I can tell you that being part of this, uh, this enterprise, one of my, I think, greatest delights is seeing our alumni go off and do amazing things. And so um, I, really, I really appreciate that. So, yes, I'm going to bring greetings. I'm the provost, and um, my guess is many of you don't know what that is. Most of my life I didn't know what that is, um, but I'm the academic vice president, so the chief academic officer of the university, and I'm bringing greetings on behalf of President Lynn LaPree, who is in California, where I, I imagine it is sunny there today, um, at a conference, so she regrets that she can't be here today, but I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of her and the entire campus community. Before I get to my formal remarks, though, I just thought, since you mentioned my retirement, Julia, um, I was just backing it up a bit before we came to Salisbury. I went to uh, University of Maryland College Park for my PhD, but I really hadn't spent much time on the Eastern Shore when I was in graduate school, and I, I grew up in an Air Force family, so we really never lived anywhere very long. But when I lived in the Upper Plains for 17 years and, and uh, worked in a university out there, I always had that kind of iconic Chesapeake Bay map on my wall. I think you remember, you remember that from years and years ago. And Salisbury's right in the middle of it. And especially during the brutal winters, I would, I would think, boy, I would give anything to live there, you know, between the bay and the ocean. And then when I saw the position advertised in uh, the fall of 2007 for the Henson Dean job here at Salisbury University, I applied and was thrilled to uh, get it. And my folks lived in Annapolis at the time. Uh, so it's just been a wonderful ride, but uh, the time has come, I think, at the end of next year for me to have a little more flexibility to be more available to my family. So now just thinking about my formal welcome, you know, everybody has a mission statement, you know, statement and certainly the university does, and part of ours says, and I won't, uh, maybe in, in the spirit of filling time, I should read the whole mission statement, but I'll spare you, um, but part of our mission statement says that believing that learning and service are vital components of civic life, Salisbury University actively contributes to the local Eastern Shore community and the educational, economic, cultural, and social needs of our state and nation. And certainly our deep relationship with the city um, and the county and the state allows us to carry out that mission, whether it's through collaboration around the arts, economic development, support for vulnerable populations, strategies for environmental sustainability, to support a healthcare environment, or the continued vitalization of downtown. And we look forward to, in the very near future, engaging with the city and um, beyond in our new general education curriculum. Um, I think those of you who participated that when you were in college may have seen that as kind of a box checking exercise, but we are really re revitalizing our general education curriculum 
to include three required experiences in civic and community engagement, environmental sustainability, and diversity and inclusion. I think the city offers us so many opportunities to um, allow students to take courses and connect with the, um, with the community around those three things. I know that each of those very close to many of your hearts and certainly to Mayor Jake Days as well. And then finally, I wanted to thank the city for um, our longstanding partnership between Salisbury University and the city of, of, of Salisbury. And this was integral in us winning in 2020 the Carnegie Foundation's uh, Community Engaged Campus designation, which is not held by a lot of campuses. It was really huge that we won it, and our Institute for um, uh, Public Affairs and Civic Engagement, really, uh, Sandy Pope was really in the lead on that. And in reviewing the applications, which are like 100 pages, Carnegie looked really closely for evidence of two-way benefit, two-way feedback, where we were really working on behalf and support of the city, and then the city was uh, working with us, supporting our students, a really integrated approach. And we had no trouble demonstrating that, and we're able to win that designation. So we're good for, I think, about eight more years, and then it'll be re-upped again. So we're delighted to host the State of the City um, tonight here on our campus, uh, rainy as it is. And I look forward to when the mayor arrives, hearing what's going on. Um, I, I think he has an excellent excuse um, tonight to be a little bit late. But um, thank you all for being here. And welcome to Salisbury University. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Olmstead, and we're so excited to see what the future partnerships uh, between SU and the city hold. Next, I would like to call up our city council president, Jack Heath, who I endearingly call dad. He has such a wonderful human and has been such a tremendous partner um, on the other side of, uh, of, of the branch of government that we have here in Salisbury to move uh, really strong programs and make really smart decisions alongside a tremendous council uh, who are also here, uh, Vice President Mirabota, uh, Councilwoman April Jackson, Councilwoman Michelle Gregory, and Councilwoman Angela Blake. So we have a quorum uh, and we are taking minutes. So Jack, please, uh, our, our city clerk is here uh, diligently uh, taking notes. So Jack, please uh, share a few words on behalf of the council. Good evening. I'm, I'm glad the mayor is almost here because I was, we were trying to figure out how we're going to stretch this. And I was trying to figure out if I remember the dance moves from when I was taking dancing lessons when I was 11. Uh, so you, I'm going to save you from that. Um, I'm going to change things. I'm going to change things up a little bit. Um, the mayor does a tremendous job, better than I could ever do, in talking about the successes of the past year. So I just want to recognize a few people first. And when I call your name, please stand. Vice President of the Council, Mr. Mir Boda. Stay standing. Councilwoman April Jackson. Councilwoman Angela Blake. And Councilwoman Michelle Gregory. May be seated. Now I'm going to <laughs> April. I can't be your dad. You're just about the same age as me. No, you're a little younger. Um, no, sincerely, I, I want to thank these people that I just introduced. We've been together now seven years, and. I think one of the things that I admire them for is their commitment. No one knows the time that we put in, and they do their homework. And another thing that I'm proud of is in the seven years that I've been president, I have never had to use the gavel in a meeting. And that's because we have mutual respect for each other. And I think that a lot of people could look at us and say, this is the way we want our organizations to run. And that's what we strive for. 
people also have, I've heard, say that we agree on everything. We never have hard discussions. And I'll say, just watch a work session. You won't see us fight. You won't see us argue in the council meetings. Those are the formal actions that we've already pre-decided in the work sessions. And the reason we can do that is because of the mutual respect we have for each other. We would not be able to have the successes that we have had if it wasn't for them. So thank you very much. I would also like to introduce someone else, and she's going to get mad. But Kim Nichols, will you stand, please? Kim, for those who don't know, is our city clerk. And I don't believe Julie's here tonight. Uh, but I also want to recognize Julie. These people do an unbelievable job. I'll tell you how efficient they are. The other night, Monday night, we had, I believe it was seven ordinances, or yeah, seven ordinances, I think, uh, and a couple of, uh, lots of minutes uh, that we approved, and a resolution. When I drove home, and I didn't stop on the way home, when I got home, everything was on my computer to sign. And that's actually it's very rare that I don't get one, every one of those things the same night. So thank you, Kim, and make sure you thank Julie for me. You guys do a tremendous job, plus she keeps me out of jail. The next group I'd like to thank is are all our city employees. This has been a heck of a couple of years. And they're, they're totally understaffed. And we know that, and we're trying to get, get help for them. But these men and women go, have gone above and beyond what's being asked of them on a daily basis. And we have some of the finest leaders in the state of Maryland. And I want to thank all of them for all that they do. If it wasn't for them, the city wouldn't be running. And you're underappreciated, but no one thing. The council appreciates you very much. So thank you. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes in reflecting back on this last year. Because you never, you never really take time to smell the roses. Notice, Nancy, I'm smell the roses, um, but we don't. And, and what I did in preparation for this is I went through the minutes of the council meetings and I just picked out things that I said, wow, yeah, I remember that and I remember that. And let me just mention a few of them. For I believe it's the fourth year in a row, no, no tax increase rate on the, the rate of the increase, nothing. Um, the speed softening. Oh, by the way, our focus on the council has been from the very beginning on public safety, the environment, and housing. Those are three priorities. And I, I think you'll agree with me, they're, they're three of the most important. So, in response to that, in response to Vision Zero, which is to reduce injuries and accidents, you've seen the speed softening, which we've had some complaints on, but it's working. Because if it wasn't working, uh, we would know it. Um, we've given salary adjustments and incentives for the police and fire service who were undermanned. And the request came and we answered. We got red light cameras, we're funding red light cameras, again towards vision, vision zero.
we've done what I think is one of the greatest things we've ever done since I've been on the council, and we approved and constructed our tiny homes on Ann Street. And if anyone, I'll put in a, anybody that's watching this, we need, in order to finish this project, a simple, say it's simple, uh, a simple 800 amp breaker. If anyone has any contacts anywhere in the world, that's, the, that's what's holding us up. So if you, if you know someone, or I've called all my business guys that I used to work with, and I'm not giving up, but we're going to have to get that in order for those homes to be occupied. We've approved the hiring of a homeless services case specialist to make sure that we don't forget what those homeless people need and to help direct them into the services that they need. We've upgraded our playgrounds. I can't remember when the playgrounds have looked in, our, in the process of being upgraded and how good they look. We're expanding the skate park again. And that's with the help of the skateboard committee, who's been with us every step of the way. We have funding for the rail trail, Fruitland to Del Mar. That's coming. We passed tree replacement legislation. If you take down a tree, you got to plant a tree. We have to do our bit to address global warming, and that's one way we can do it, and it's a personal way. And the infamous plastic bag legislation. I told the story for anybody. Did anybody see the council meeting Monday night on PAC 14? I, I mentioned this. Uh, at the meeting, and I'll mention it again. Um, in case you didn't know, the, all of the council members get um, frequently um, emails and voice messages from constituents who, in some cases, thank us for what we do, and in other cases, not so much. And gentleman, I won't, name, I won't name who he is, but a gentleman sent and said, you know what, we're losing all of our rights and you're going to make us stop using plastic bags. Why don't we just tell the people to stop littering? And that's really worked in the past. Um, and I, th I think that We'll, we've all taken heat. We've all taken heat. But I will tell you, I don't have any trouble sleeping at night, and I don't think any of the other members of the, of the council do too. So having said that, I'm looking forward to 2023. This is the final year of our term coming up. And I hope and pray, with the help of God, that we can make decisions to continue to make this city a better place for all of our citizens. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Jack. And again, thank you for your partnership. It is a pleasure to work with you and uh, our entire council. So last but not least, before we get the man of the hour up here, who is now in the building, uh, I would like to invite up our wonderful Poet Laureate, who always paints such a beautiful picture of our city and, uh, again, like John, slows things down and helps us think a little differently. So, Nancy, please join me up here. I have to tell you that it's been the greatest honor of my life to serve as your Poet Laureate and to commemorate and chronicle these very special occasions. Um, to tag on to what uh, Jack just related about the city council, I've only been to two full meetings uh, this week and the week before for the Green Wave 
in support of the plastic ban. And I got just a little glimpse in the phenomenal work that the city council does to make the city what it is. And I just think we are very, very lucky. The great poet Walt Whitman said, a great city is that which has the greatest men and women. And we do. We do. This poem is dedicated to Mayor Jake Day, the city council and team, and the people of Salisbury. Ode to the City on the Hill, Salisbury, Maryland. You faithful beam of light, which these past years raging storm winds of adversity could not extinguish, but rather fanned your flame to burn more brightly and fuel the realization of a vision, a renaissance, a transformation of architecture, commerce, culture, and industry rooted in dreams of equality and equity. Your wise and astute leaders perceive the chasm between those who have and have not, and labor tirelessly behind the scenes to bridge the distance and they, in turn, inspire others to join the team and lead a helping hand happily and generously. Compassionate, you take care of your own. Shelter your unhoused, pave the way to ease the hardships for the disabled, and welcome and celebrate our rich diversity. In you, no decision is made or mandate created unless it supports the proclamation, we are all equal here. Keen to the human need for culture, music, and community, you provide them free and abundantly. And the soul's longing for natural beauty and repose, you fulfill with public gardens, parks, and green spaces home to natural species and pollinator bees and birds. Yes, our fair city on the hill, into the years you'll shine on into the outlying dark and draw others like moths to the city of integrity, ingenuity, respect and kindness, and equality. And should we travel near or far from you, we will carry you in our hearts. And they will know us by your light. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So for the moment you've all been waiting for, the man that needs no introduction, our mayor, Jake Day. Good evening. So I just flew in from Washington. It's the start of a joke. And, uh, and it kind of felt like that as we nearly hydrophilined quite a few times trying to get back here as quickly as possible. No, no, Andy, you're a great driver. Uh, look, I, I just want to say, and I said this uh, a moment ago, um, you know, social media posts sitting back there listening. You know, we're so blessed. Um, Dr. Olmstead, thank you for having us here. Um, John, thank you. And, and Jack, thank you. Nancy, uh, uh, where'd you go? You're such a talent. You really are. And we're blessed that you're a poet laureate. I, I know Jack mentioned this right before I got here, but you know we're also blessed that we have a team um, that works so well together. And uh, it wasn't always so in our community. So uh, to Jack, to Muir, to April, Michelle, to Angela, thank you for being that team for our community. So welcome to the charter mandated 2022 State of the City Address. I'm going to give you an update on the state of our city, but it's a snapshot in time, right? But what I want you to remember is that for four, eight, 12, whatever years, we're but stewards of this community that is on a continuous and unending path from 1732 until wherever we're headed. And the most important question for us to consider is during that time, 
when we're the trusted stewards, how much did we get done to make progress on each of the measures of a healthy city? And if we think not just about our vantage point today, November 2022, and asking that question from where we sit in this moment, well, let's put ourselves in the shoes of our forefathers, in the mayor's seat, behind the council table, in the squad car, or on the riding mower, or the jump seat, or at the lever that they held at that time. What would their motivators and what did their vantage point suggest that a great city should be? How are we answering the question that they would have asked themselves at that time, what does a better Salisbury look like? So come back in time with me. Let's look back at their words and view with their eyes where we were and where we are today. The year is 1968. This beautiful new plaza demonstrates new life a new appreciation of the better things of life. It shows that this is a city trying to be known for its people. So said Congressman Rogers C.B. Morton. The American landscape was changing. The advent of the modern automobile industry made it possible for people to move further from work. The American suburb became the desirable dream for middle-class families. And as cities from Salisbury to Frederick to Houston empty to their populations, Urban cores changed in their role from the shopping epicenter to a nine-to-five office park that would become a ghost town every evening. Every city official would be focused on how to renew and revitalize their city and their downtown. And as single uses clustered into new development patterns like suburban indoor shopping malls, the question became one of novelty. How do we create interesting alternatives to those malls? In hundreds of American cities in the 1960s, the answer was outdoor pedestrian plazas. This strategy worked in a lasting way in but a few American cities, Burlington, Vermont, Charlottesville, Virginia, Miami Beach, Florida. But in most places, more shops closed and left for higher traffic counts. So the toil continued in, as, in Salisbury as city leaders, shop owners, and residents struggled to find answers and invested heavily in thoughtful planning processes. In 2015, the downtown master plan presented just such a process and just such a vision. With the input of thousands of Salisbury residents, this plan gave us something to follow. And checking off items on that to-do list over seven years, we have seen a downtown not complete, but completely transformed. Today you can find 20 restaurants, bars, and bakeries, 70 small businesses, retailers, and shops. Every single building renovated since the year 1990. And for the first time in recent memory, every single building either fully occupied or under construction. You can find a totally renovated river walk with new landscaping and lighting. All of those forgotten spaces filled with lovable parks, an amphitheater, a labyrinth, a dog park, an edible garden, and a riverfront games park. And you'll find the first stages of a new living room for our city, Unity Square, with the rest starting construction in the coming months. And most importantly, you'll find the construction of the first new private building in over half a century in saying that that's true. Perhaps the single symbol that our forefathers and dreamers of this city always hoped for, but never existed until 2022. A tower crane, 220 feet in the air over our city's heart. The year is 1983. I am enthused by the renewal of widespread interest in community-oriented events. It makes you feel good about the place you live. That's Mayor W. Paul Martin speaking to the Daily Times on the occasion of the first Salisbury Festival. Closing off the streets of a downtown has one upside. It makes it easy to occupy those streets for events. Salisbury has a proud history of community events. In the 1940s, we hosted a, an earlier version of the Salisbury Festival, and it came back to life in 1983. But as its second act faded, we picked up that mantle, and we hosted a revived downtown Salisbury Festival, and later Riverfest. But we didn't stop there. We dreamed bigger than ever with the goal of establishing a consistent and diverse schedule of events for our citizens and a few crown jewels along the way. For example, we stood up the Mid-Atlantic's best and fastest Boston qualifying marathon. With our confidence built, we threw our hat in the ring with 36 other cities, large and small, in an effort to bring the National Folk Festival to Salisbury. And I don't have to tell you how that one turned out. We established a regular series of open air movies and concerts, all free to our citizens. Bringing movies and live music downtown on a regular basis required us to turn a decades-long dream into a reality. And those laughing, clapping, singing crowds 
filled the spaces that had previously been empty and reflected the dreams of our predecessors. That's our big goal for 1990, getting the pavilion built. It will provide a permanent facility for outdoor performances in the warm weather. That's Davina Grace Hill, director of Salisbury Arts Council, speaking to the Daily Times about what seemed to be a project on the brink of becoming a reality in 1989. The chamber proposed the construction of an entertainment facility on the site of Riverwalk Park, where the amphitheater is located today. By bringing the National Folk Festival to Salisbury, we were able to successfully lobby our, our partners in state government to help get us across the finish line. Quality of life, high quality places, the arts, parks, those things that make a community lovable were secondary concerns. But today, the way we view arts and entertainment, recreational opportunities, and cultural enrichment has changed. And our prioritization of the arts will soon and for many years come to manifest themselves as the Maryland Folk Festival. This festival, its predecessor as the National, has been the catalyst of our revitalization. With $67 million in direct economic impact, some 400,000 visitors visiting over the course of four years that we served as host city. We've been given a tremendous gift, and it's incumbent upon us to do everything we can to maintain that excitement, that enthusiasm, and that volunteering spirit to keep it alive. Now, anyone who has volunteered in Salisbury knows it takes a small army to plan, schedule, coordinate, and execute the events that we've come to expect. But if we truly want to be the cultural capital of the Eastern Shore, we can't only depend on community organizations to do the heavy lifting. Government's got to do its part as well. And that's why this year, Salisbury created the Arts, Business, and Culture Department. This team is tasked with identifying unique entertainment opportunities, staffing those opportunities, developing and implementing marketing campaigns, and providing technical and production assistance. Our most beloved attraction that they care for, the Salisbury Zoo, remains at the center of our efforts to be a unique regional amenity. Construction is soon to be completed on the long overdue administrative building. That was an applause line for certain council members <laughs> who have fought hard for that, by the way. We've welcomed new sloths, new red wolves, baby wallabies, and two new Andean bear cubs this year. Coming soon is a new pavilion that can be rented for outdoor events and weddings. We ought not to forget the joy that these amenities provide. Look no further than what a splash of paint can do on a building or, or a neighborhood. And I don't mean to make light of public art. It takes incredible effort, and it transforms a community. Today, you can find 20 painted electric transformers, 10 murals, four sculpture projects throughout the city center. Just a few weeks ago, we cut a ribbon on the largest mural in Salisbury on the side of the Evolution Craft Brewery. And just a week before that, we cut a ribbon on a horizontal mural at Waterside Park. Prioritizing the arts, cultural enrichment, recreational opportunities pays off, and the proof is in the pudding. The year is 1993. It looks bad, real bad, but I'll be all right. It just may take a while to find another job. That was Fred Cunningham, Campbell Soup. You can recall the names with me. Campbell Soup, Dresser Wayne, Labanol, Brunswick, Chris Craft. Those five names alone represent just over 2,000 jobs that are gone from this community. And while American manufacturing has continued to decline, even 2020, 2021, 2022, siphoned away by lax regulation in places like Mexico and China, Salisbury maintains the highest level of manufacturing employment in the state. 12% manufacturing employment tied with the second highest uh, sector of employment in our city, professional and administrative services. Salisbury has seen a nearly 30% growth in the number of manufacturing firms from 2015 to 2022. That figure mostly includes small and highly skilled firms oriented on defense, communications, agri-tech, and life sciences. Thank you, Dave Ryan. During that same period, since 2015, we've added more than 7,000 jobs to the Coral Wicomico County. And there are more on the horizon with the recent announcement of 150 jobs coming to our beloved Chesapeake Shipbuilding. And these jobs aren't paying what they used to pay. Per capita income has finally started to rise. 
Dur since the Great Recession, per capita income has risen over 15%. These statistics are all a reflection of the hard work to, that we have put in to make a comfortable place to live for families starting their life or choosing to leave behind larger metropolitan areas. And you've all likely seen these superlatives lately. Salisbury has become the number one place that people moving out of the Washington, D.C. metro area are moving to. Salisbury has become the number one place that people are moving out of the Baltimore metropolitan area to. With more and more people moving here, I know what you're all thinking. The housing market. The real estate crash of 2008 is not a distant memory for most of us. Some of these people are four or five months behind on mortgage payments and haven't heard from lenders. Banks probably have people a lot more behind to worry about. That was Bill McCain, county councilman and president of W.R. McCain Associates in 2008. We all remember what that felt like. And while there are real risks, in, risks inherent in rising interest rates, material costs, and the scarcity of materials, and people to put them together into housing, we face a very different kind of crisis than we faced in 2008. Today, housing costs are rising at twice the rate uh, of wage growth. Nearly two-thirds of renters in America say they can't afford to buy a home. Demand is at its highest and supply is at its lowest. And with the ink now dry on the 2020 census results, we know that nearly all of the Eastern Shore's population growth from 2010 until today occurred only within the city of Salisbury limits. Housing values have skyrocketed 50% in three years, right here. The average that a home is on the market has shrunk to eight days. Salisbury has led the assessable value increase in the state three years in a row. People want to be here, but we don't have the houses for them. Just one year ago, recognizing that it's, this was the single most destructive force facing most people in our community, we announced the Heroes Home legislative package. This three-legged stool of policy solutions sought to address unaffordability, the housing supply shortage, and homelessness. And the reaction of the market was overwhelming. Home builders, landowners, and real estate developers responded with, over the course of a 90-day window with $1.4 billion in new housing proposals. To put that in context, that's a 175% increase in total existing housing in Salisbury. That represents a 67% increase in the total accessible base of our city. Over 8,000 new housing units were proposed, including single family, duplexes, townhomes, student housing, uh, affordable housing, uh, assisted living, and, and senior uh, or age-restricted facilities. That's more housing than has been added in the last 27 years to Salisbury, the past 22 years to Wicomico County in its entirety. And that's three times the number of houses that were added to the entire eastern shore since 2010. This work represents the creation of an estimated 28,000 construction jobs over the coming years, and 14,000 permanent jobs if built out entirely, but also grow our population 65%. For a city that saw a housing construction slowdown like the rest of our nation since 2008, here is home will and already has gotten us back on track. Today, more than 1,500 of those homes are already under construction, with the most visible of those units rising higher in the air than any other apartment building on the Delmarva Peninsula. And it isn't just housing that's being built. It's everything. And to give you some context as to what those numbers look like with respect to history, since I first joined the City Council, we've seen $604 million in construction. Far and away the busiest time for growth in our city's history. And in no year have we seen more construction than in 2022. $138 million in construction activity in one year. That tops 1990 and 2007, the previous number one and number two years, when the center at Salisbury was built and North Point Plaza with Target were built. Construction activity doubled from 2014 to 2017 to the 2018 to 2021 period, and doubled again just in 2022. There's no more stark and simple indicator of our progress than people wanting to invest their money or move their family to a community. And we have the capacity to grow it even more. The year is 2005. Wastewater treatment plants need to be upgraded to make sure that spills like this don't happen in the future. And Salisbury's taking strides. So said Alan Gerard of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. When it was discovered that the wastewater treatment plant had spilled 400,000 gallons 
of raw sewage into the Wicomico River in 2005. The call to action was immediate. We knew the health of our river was in crisis. Our wastewater treatment plant is one of our city's most important facilities. The environmental impact of a plant like that can be massive, no matter how you swing it. But after years of spills and various other detrimental environmental consequences, the confluence of old infrastructure and big thinkers meant that we finally completely overhauled the plant. We've already seen record return on that investment. The new plant has consistently maintained greater than 72% reduction in 90% reduction, excuse me, 70% reduction in nitrogen and 92% reduction in phosphorus to the river, making for the cleanest effluent our city has ever produced. Protecting our waterways is a sentiment that's woven into every bit of our sustainability efforts, but it couldn't be done without an incredible waterworks team to help in maintaining a clean and healthy Wicomico River in Chesapeake Bay. The idea of it being near and removing a forest, which is so close to one of the prongs of a watershed, really bothered me. Because those trees and that forest really serve as a natural filter, and we don't have much of that left in this county. That was Barry Johansson, Executive Director of Wicomico Environmental Trust. It was precisely this ethic that led to the largest conservation easement in a municipality in Maryland, the Naylor Mill Park and Trails. It was an unconventional response to a quintessential conundrum. Only one thing could go there, but two things wanted to be there. And at the end of the day, it was our ethic, oriented on the Wicomico River, that made the decision easy. Our efforts to protect our limited water resources extends deeper than surface waters, though. At least 300 feet deep, right? Where's Corey? I think I'm getting that measure right. Our water treatment plants have consistently produced Maryland's best tasting drinking water, all drawn from the coastal plain aquifer. Five of the past seven years. Not only can we say we're providing clean water, but we're providing the best tasting drinking water as well. We've made monumental strides in our sustainability efforts, establishing a green team composed of some of our region's best sustainability minds, tasking them with tuning in to the needs of our, the environmental needs of our residents. And with their help and the help of former sustainability specialist Alyssa Hastings, who, by the way, is the first and only sustainability officer in a Maryland municipality or in an Eastern Shore municipality. Did I? Is she here? She's back there. Hey, Alyssa, there she is. She doesn't work for us anymore, by the way. Don't applaud her. Don't, don't. I'm teasing. She's wonderful, and she's going to go work for Senator Van Hollen now. But their work helped to ensure that we became a bee-friendly city, a bird-friendly city, a bike-friendly city and even an Arbor Day Foundation tree city. We resurrected the Environmental Policy Task Force, which established and prioritized sustainability goals for other aspects of the city. And in response, our citizens have showed up. There's a palpable drive to make our city a, a greener and cleaner place. During COVID pandemic, one of our citizens exemplified this dedication. He showed up and he showed up again. Craig Fonts made it his mission to reduce litter throughout our city cleaning up bucket after bucket of cigarette butts, plastic bottles, fast, fast food trash, and plastic bags strewn in gutters and across parking lots. And at this year's Earth Day celebration at the zoo, I was proud to name him Salisbury's first Secretary of Clean Streets, establishing a relationship between volunteers and city government that will inspire others to follow in his footsteps. Soon, we hope to make his job significantly easier with the introduction and passage of the Comprehensive Litter Reduction Ordinance product of the Shop Green SBY initiative. This law will eliminate plastic bags at the point of sale in Salisbury in 2023. By doing that, on the front end, we will see significantly less litter in our streets, and that will be less litter in our river. This shift is a long time coming, and it will cement Salisbury as an environmental leader, something that we continue to strive for statewide. I'm proud to be a city that leads in ways that reflect our values a city that is kinder to our planet and kinder to its inhabitants. The year is 2007. What we need most of all from the city is compassion. Don't look past us or look at us like we're diseased. Living in these desolate places makes you feel destitute and lonely. That was a homeless resident of Salisbury, Gregory Dennis. Ever since the Federal Housing Act in 1965, the federal government has taken an approach to homelessness that pretends to solve a problem without ever getting close enough to understand it and without ever even coming close to adequately funding. it. Recognizing that Mr. Dennis's plea is what we must keep front of mind, we met with the Continuum of Care, the collective of organizations that works on homelessness on the Lower Shore. 
frustrated by the fact that the city was not yet at the table, and yet the phone on my desk constantly rang from residents concerned about homelessness and panhandling and wanted us to do something about it. I posed the question to the COC. If we were going to get involved, what would you have us do? And their response was stunningly simple. There was one answer. House the homeless. Federal funding and most housing programs to date took the approach that we had to get the homeless ready to be housed. There was, however, a new perspective. That every human being was inherently ready to have a roof over their heads. And that housing was the first and only way to take a step toward getting them to a place where they didn't have to worry about safety. They didn't have to worry about cleanliness. They could worry about the deeper issues that had gotten them to that place. So within a few months, the city of Salisbury had a new department, the Housing and Community Development Department. And that team has a homelessness division that is now four positions strong. We've housed 33 people permanently who were formerly chronically homeless. Once permanently housed, our city voucher program is met with wraparound case management. And the pandemic taught us that this problem isn't going away. There are still people on the street, and we are committed to being a government entity that will end homelessness. That's why through our Here is Home program, we announced the creation of a transitional dwelling unit program, and ultimately, the Ann Street Village. This will provide transitional housing for up to two years for 24 individuals, providing them with wraparound services, shower, bathrooms, laundry, and mail services, and a safe, warm space from which they can get their life in order and start to work on those deeper issues. That project is now under construction and will soon be home as long as we get that 800 amp breaker. I heard you. <laughs> it will soon be home to those who today have no home. These solutions have helped us divert people from the criminal justice system, emergency medical system, and our emergency department who have received basic care from a more sound footing, freeing up our police officers, our doctors, our firefighters, and EMTs to focus on more serious and deeper burdens. The year is 2009. I'm here to work shoulder to shoulder with the men and women of the SPD to push down crime and the fear of crime, and also to get to the root causes of crime in Salisbury. That was Police Chief Barbara Duncan upon her arrival to our community. We wanted someone who could, could combat long-running, persistent policing issues in our city head on, but with a twist. We wanted someone who valued holistic, community-centric practices that would establish good rapport with our citizens, and more specifically, with our youth. The Salisbury that she arrived to was not dissimilar from most places in America after a long decline in crime from 1994 to the early 2000s. Crime had risen back to its 1980s levels, reaching a climax in 2009. Since that time, our police department has reached new heights and has brought our crime rates to new lows. From 2006 to 2016, Salisbury had the fastest declining crime rate of any city in the United States. 100% decrease in arson, a 63% decrease in burglary, and total part one crimes decreased almost 50% from 2010 to 2020. And crime continues to drop, as it has every single year since 2017, bucking the national trend through the pandemic of rising crime rates. This is all to say, while we've reinvented our approach to policing, we've seen a steady decline in crime as a result. And this is how trust is built and rebuilt. We have readily acknowledged that our officers have perhaps the most difficult job in America, entrusted with deciding life from death protecting and risking their own life, expected to make all decisions in an instant, and serving under a microscope with the worst examples always caught on camera and shared a million times over. And we believe to be trusted, you must be trustworthy. We were a regional and state leader in our body camera program, and we have had a massive shift in our attention to officers' quality of life with equipment, an expanded take-home vehicle program, new weapons, and an on-site fitness center focusing on physical and mental health. When the proper resources are prioritized, our citizens reap the benefits, and that is clearer nowhere more so than with our youth. We resolutely believe this proposed curfew ordinance does not address the root causes of juvenile crimes and thus will not solve the problem. That was Theo Williams, who at the time represented the Salisbury Wicomico Youth Civics Council. 
And he was speaking on 2015's proposed youth curfew, which applied to children 16 and younger. As you likely remember, the curfew wasn't approved. And as weeks and months passed without any thoughtful efforts to combat them, juvenile crimes persisted throughout the city and rose. We knew that that root cause was our target, and so we set out to find an actual solution, one that we could maintain and support with people-first programs and concrete goals. We determined neighborhoods where juvenile arrests were rising, and we looked into what set these neighborhoods apart, and it became glaringly obvious. These neighborhoods had no youth programming, or limited youth programming. They didn't have the facilities, and certainly not the resources, or the community outreach that they deserved. The system failed them, and setting, setting them up on a path with one clear endpoint. So we had to offer our youth a safe space, the freedom to choose a new path. So we got to work. Now I've learned that sometimes building community means just that, quite literally, constructing community. So we started with the Newton Street Community Center in 2018. That opened finally in summer 2021, and it opened with open arms to the community. We offered after school activities, 3D printer, uh, homework help, cooking classes, music studio space, a philosophy club, uh, and much more. Every room in Newton is now bursting with potential, with the potential for a new art project, a new experience, a new conversation, or a new friend. We encouraged expression, and fostered relationships with neighborhood families. And we gave our youth a reliable and safe place to find their path. And the same thing's happening at the Truett Street Community Center, where we broke ground on the second building just a week ago. And these aren't the only assets that we built for our kids in recent years. The Salisbury Skate Park, currently in the midst of its third and final phase, and construction uh, set to be complete in the coming weeks. These spaces have become crown jewels in our city, exceeding expectations and affecting real change in young lives. Proud as I am of these facilities, we can't let four walls define the extent of our services. This can be as simple as setting up a pop-up bus stop, bringing out a grill to our neighborhood walk, Newtown, Prince Street, Doverdale, Smith Street, North Camden, places that we have walked and doors that we have knocked just in the last year. We've knocked doors all across the city. We've ate, ate a burger or a snow cone with a new friend. I've ate two snow cones with a new friend. We've shared a laugh or a smile. The year is 2018. Anything is better than what is there now. I'm all for the circle. So said my friend Linda Dwyer. God rest her soul. Historically and across the nation, streets have been planned and designed with the speed and convenience of the driver in mind. High accident intersections and other problem areas were addressed by increasing signage or enforcement. And neither of those solutions even made a dent in the problem. To put it plainly, our roads have been too wide and too fast for too long. What changed our approach was changing our vision. In 2018, the city adopted Vision Zero, a plan that challenges us to re reimagine what our infrastructure should look like, and more specifically, to accept that deaths on our streets were not a given. They were the consequence of our own refusal to prioritize the lives of innocent Salisburyans over our comfort and convenience. Among the problem areas named, and this is named in a 1975 report, were overused cross-town cross -town traffic streets, including East, uh, excuse me, Eastern Shore Drive and Carroll Street, two of the thoroughfares that were targeted for action on the high injury crash network under Vision Zero. Work is already underway on Carroll Street, and visioning has been completed for Eastern Shore Drive to make those streets safer by re reducing both volume and speed of traffic while using leftover space to provide pedestrian and bike facilities to make them more accessible to people who do not own or do not choose to use their automobile. Since Vision Zero was adopted, injury accidents have fallen 19% in the city and no fatalities have occurred on city streets. What's more, all categories of accidents have declined, while nationwide crashes have risen during the same period, 18%. Changing these streetscapes Making them more human friendly also serves to eliminate the perfectly designed moats or avenues of high speed traffic that serve to isolate parts of the city from others. In the case of Carroll Street, the volume of high speed traffic and the width of the roadway served to create a decades long non transversible barrier, keeping not only residents of the Camden neighborhood, but also our largest employer's employees, Title Health, from being able to access downtown Salisbury on foot safely. It led to an overall sense of separation 
and an overall decline in the number of folks who saw downtown as a leisurely option or a safe option for shopping and recreation. By narrowing lanes and reducing both volume and speed and connecting our urban greenway, which was a vision I first identified in 1965 with pedestrian and cycle facilities, we're throwing the door open wide again, telling our citizens that yes, the heart of the city is yours. Much of Carroll Street is being given back to the Riverwalk Park, which has been in included in every major revitalization plan from 1965 to today as the Urban Greenway. It's goal to link the east and west of the city through a continuous non-vehicular route. Intersecting with the Urban Greenway is the Salisbury Rail Trail, heading from Del Mar to Fruitland, north to south, providing safe access for pedestrians and cyclists through the heart of the city, connecting two of our biggest assets, Salisbury University and that Naylor Mill Park. Just last month, ground was broken on the northernmost section of the rail trail. That we have seen such positive results in such a short time speaks of the efficacy of our actions. Nationally, traffic accidents continue to rise, yet Salisbury bucks the trend. Ultimately, that's our goal. I'd like to never again have to sit across from a family whose child was hit by a car and tell them, we knew the answer, but we thought people would be too mad about it. So we didn't do it. After all, this city has sought to perfect its delivery of life-saving services for centuries, or at least 150 years. The year is 1886. The sun arose the next day to reveal Salisbury's worst fire disaster. The entire business section, 22 acres of stores, town hall, post office, church, and many homes were in ruins. This is from a Salisbury Fire Department 100th anniversary retrospective. This diligence was laid bare in the wake of not one but two devastating fires that ravaged our city and even consumed the lone hand pump apparatus used to fight it. The Salisbury Fire Department was officially established in 1879 as an all-volunteer force. In 1909, city leadership passed a resolution establishing a 40-man force to be employed full-time by the city of Salisbury. Now, this didn't spell the end of a volunteer firefighting in the city. As a matter of fact, the hybrid volunteer career model has long helped to ensure our ability to assemble an effective firefighting force, even today. We see that volunteer and career relationship evolving to fit current demands, not just in Salisbury, but countywide and nationwide. And it's shifted to lead the region as a sterling example of an effective combination department responding to over 15,000 calls for service last year. The firefighting spirit is perhaps felt strongest on the city's east side. For decades, Station 2 stood at the northwest corner of Brown and Naylor Streets. Responders came from the surrounding neighborhood to help their fellow citizens when the call came in. On warmer summer evenings, the men could be seen cleaning the various engines and fire apparatuses outside of the Lone Bay. Today, that tradition continues just on the other side of the street. The state-of-the-art facility that now stands directly across the street where Station 2 used to be represents and com our commitment to ensuring the safety of our citizens and the safety of our firefighters and EMTs. And yes, you can still see them shining with the engines on a warm evening, or more likely, racing to provide assistance to a citizen in need. But not everything our fire department does is so outwardly visible. Some of their efforts have been more discreet, and that's the case with our SWIFT team. Since 2018, the Salisbury Wicomico Integrated First Care Team has provided compassionate, proactive care to citizens who typically have no other option or don't know of the other options than a 911 call for a non-emergency concern. Today, SWIFT has enrolled 195 patients. That's up from 90 in 2019. The national benchmark for a conversion, that's when a patient has a history of making 911 calls that are deemed unnecessary. The national benchmark is 35%. This year, our SWIFT team maintained a conversion rate of 90% of those patients. This approach has helped drastically de decrease the number of inappropriate 911 calls, and it's indicative of the same heart and spirit that led those first firefighters to volunteer way back in the 1800s. The year's 1973. It's like somebody giving you an elephant. You've still got to feed it. That was then Council President W. Paul Martin discussing the looming costs associated with the city taking possession of Poplar Hill Mansion. 
The home was eventually bought from Wicomico County for a dollar. Wise words that foreshadowed the many legacy costs that government shoulders over time. There are some more expensive ones, are there not, Julia? Of course, times change and standards evolve. The internet has provided us the ability to make our financial processes more transparent than our forebears ever could have imagined. But our mission is the same as theirs, to make the absolute most of every dollar while improving the lives of our citizens who have entrusted the well-being of the city to us. Could they have anticipated an annual budget that was so transparent, so well put together, so easily comprehended by taxpayers, so readily available to the citizens to see where their tax dollars are going, down to the cent. Could they have imagined that Salisbury's budget would be recognized by the National Government Finance Officers Account Association of America as one of the best for five years running, every year since we first submitted our budget for consideration? And do you think they would have imagined do you think they could have envisioned five straight years of audits that produced not a single note? Wouldn't any municipality find it hard to believe that their budgetary and fiscal processes could be so well managed, so well stewarded as beyond reproach? I like to think that Mayor Martin, or Council President Martin at the time, a stalwart watchdog of the public dollar, would have approved of what we're doing. The year is 2004. City employees did not get a raise last year, and maybe won't again this year. But you won't notice any difference. Your garbage will still get picked up, and the snow will still be plowed. I'm proud to say that my husband is a public works employee. That was city resident Heather Pfeiffer. Dedication to service. That's what gets a city employee out of bed at 3 a.m. to respond to a water main break. Local government jobs could scarcely be considered glamorous. But the work has always been considered to be stable. Historically, pay raises for Salisbury employees have been periodic, sometimes years between. Pay would lurch closer to where it should be and then stagnate for a couple years. One of my top priorities upon taking office was to give every employee peace of mind by instituting regular, predictable pay raises that keep pace with an economy as well as rewarding effort. And I hope you know the primary reason for that is so that they can be confident and comfortable while they go out and work for each of you. There's more to employee morale than how much we take home. We want to feel valued, appreciated. We want to know that an honest day's work still means something. We want to know that our citizens are taken care of to the best of our ability. When you have an organization with a team mentality, all wheels are putting down power. To foster that team mindset and a sense of camaraderie amongst our employees, we set up some new traditions that bring us together in fun, relaxing, and enjoyable ways. An annual night at the Shorebirds. Two annual staff meetings where we talk about what's going on in our city. An annual holiday dinner and awards banquet. These are moments where we celebrate and commend those employees who have gone above and beyond in doing their job. Recognition does so much for a person's heart. Even the most humble of us feels good when we're seen. This is precisely why we also began an Employee of the Month and Employee of the Year program. All these gains, however, are fragile. They could be fleeting. The truth is, I'm not going to be mayor forever. Julie is not going to be city administrator ever. Okay, maybe Julie is going to be city administrator forever. Council will change. Senior leader roles will shift. And for that reason, I made it a priority to secure what we have built for our employees and the city they serve. This year, the City Council adopted the groundbreaking charter change and made it law that city employees may engage in collective bargaining. I've always believed in the efficacy and importance of unions in the workplace. But giving our employees more control over their pay and working conditions is the right thing to do. And it makes us even more attractive to job applicants at a time when the market is saturated with available positions and when it is incredibly difficult to keep people in their job. Over the coming months, we will finalize our labor code and begin negotiating contracts with our nearly 470 city employees. The year is 1964. Beginning in September 1965, assignment of white students living in formerly all Negro school areas will be made. This was in the Daily Times, March 11th, 1964. Segregated schools were a reality in our country and our city just over 60 years ago. And some in this room may even recall a time when this was their reality or their grandparents' or parents' reality. 
We aren't terribly far off from 1965 in more ways than one. Our country continues to see hate that divides us. We see inequality embraced on television. We see hate crimes filmed on cell phones. We see communities torn apart, and yet we are proud to be a city where all are welcome. We do more than just say it. This year we became the first city in our region to host a pride parade right through the heart of downtown. We hosted the fifth annual Juneteenth celebration and proudly renamed Broad Street Black Lives Matter Boulevard back in 2020. Standing side by side with residents of all races as we process the state and national racial unrest. We created our lynching memorial task force and advocated for the removal, ultimately successful, of our longstanding Confederate sign, replacing it with a marker of the three racial terror lynchings that had occurred in our community just a few feet away. Yet still, we must acknowledge that this representation can't be the end. We have a responsibility to do more, to be more for each and every one of our citizens. We have to start the conversation and open the doors for those whose voices were long overpowered by government and institutions with little care to hear them. We can't just claim that all are welcome here and put up some banners. We have a responsibility to make it true. This kind of opportunity for citizens has to be there. And that's why we created the Truth, Racial Unity, Transformation, and Healing Committee, or Truth Committee. Like all of our boards and commissions, this committee will provide guidance to myself and the council, a direct line to the senior leaders of the city to advise us on ongoing racial injustice, policy recommendations to facilitate racial healing, and suggestions of cultural partnership and more. This committee will take us into this city's next chapter of representation of equality and justice for all. And I'm proud to walk alongside them in this mission to replace division with unity and hate with love. The year is 2022. We stand not in judgment of the motives or the actions of our forefathers, rather in full faith that their motives were pure and that they wanted a Salisbury better than what they found. Our motives we know are pure. We want to protect the lives of Salisburyans simply trying to go about their day with the means at their disposal. We want to build a city of opportunity where every child born here believes they can stay and have a bright future here. We want to build a city that shines bright enough as a beacon across the Chesapeake and the canal and beckons to those who seek a more comfortable life. And one that not only lives up to, but constantly improves upon their expectations. Like those who came before, we have dreams. I've dreamt, first as a little kid, and now has a gray hair, of a city that affords, Julia is the only person to laugh at that, Thank you, Julia. We'll talk about that on Monday. That affords dignity to its destitute. A city that returns equal footing to its historically oppressed. A city that bestows kindness upon its fearful. A city bold enough to make and cement what was almost always left to ink and imagination. Let us hope that we will be measured by our boldness and swiftness more than our precision. For I imagine that our successors will ask of the last decade, did they do what needed to be done to make change? Or did they just talk about it? So have we done what we needed to do to make change? Have we done in our time as temporary stewards all we can to achieve the visions of our forefathers and ours today? If we believe the answer to that question is yes, then how dare we stop? If we believe that, even if we don't think every step was perfect in our miles-long journey, even if we know that maybe we weren't always as precise as we wanted to be, then how dare we deviate from the progress that has been made? How dare we let anything slow down or stop this most important work? So march on with me. Let us run even faster and work even harder and not quit until there is no fight left in us to make this little city the best small city in America. God bless every single one of you. God bless you for your time, for marching with me, and for sticking with us all the way to the end. God bless you.